Bloodborne, or as I like to call it, Average Victorian Child Simulator, is unsurprisingly a game set in Britain. Disgusting. Bloodborne is the type of game that starts with you fisting a dog in the doctor's office and ends with you beating up a pensioner in a cemetery. In other words, a really good time. From Software took a look at their masterfully created, impeccably balanced, non-exploitable in any way masterpiece that is Dark Souls, and said, what if we made that again, but fast? And that's the true story behind the creation of this Lovecraftian-inspired, gothic horror, Victorian, questionable child labour laws epic that is Bloodborne. A story that will have you waking up in your local doctor's office from a non-consensual prostate exam, to going to church and carrying out the good lord's work by beating anything that dares be different than you, to heading down to the local lake for a skinny dip, beating up some nerds at school, and battling your sleep paralysis demons <laughs> by entering a nightmare to quite literally battle your sleep paralysis demons. Bloodborne still very much follows the basic formula set by the previous FromSoft games. That being, having an existential crisis while pondering what it is you're really doing with your life as this clump of pixels kills you for the thousandth time, as well as having the satisfying gameplay loop of exploring, unlocking shortcuts, levelling up and killing bosses, but mostly the existential crisis part. And while structurally being very similar to Dark Souls, something it differs greatly in is its excellent atmosphere and sound design. While going for that Victorian gothic horror setting, they absolutely hit the nail on the head with recreating an immersive and true-to-life version of England. You fuck You fucking You fuck It's as if I can almost smell the piss-soaked streets and hear the racist remarks of big boy Kev down the local pub who thinks that immigrants should go back to their own country. It's even so realistic that I can't go five steps down the street without being stabbed to death. Do you want some? I'll give it you. Of course I would like to grace your ears with the privilege of being immersed into this dark, horrific setting as you run down these cobblestone streets, hearing the cries and moans of the locals after realising they've ran out of their last can of Stella, all while the foreboding chimes of the clock tower ring out in the distance. But thanks to my capture card, that was £400 by the way, my audio weaver sounds like this. Or this. I think someone's trying to summon Satan inside of my PlayStation. While different from Dark Souls, Bloodborne isn't entirely foreign either. Kev wouldn't like that. Remember Blight Town and how it ran at that silky smooth 23 FPS for that peak cinematic look? Well now imagine that's the entire game. After jumping into Bloodborne for myself about seven years too late, I can finally understand why there's such a want for a remake, PC port, or at the very least a frame rate boost for the PS5, because it can truly feel like an absolute masterpiece of a game at times. But the only thing that's holding it back is that it runs about as well as a disabled toddler. But fortunately, we don't live in the era of Spartans throwing unsightly babies into the sea, and we live in a world where we can help them overcome their struggles. So FromSoft, please help my baby boy walk. Speaking of my baby boy, here's Wilhelm, looking like a character right out of a PS2 game, as I'm once again laughing at the difference between a small and large-headed character, wondering what you could possibly fit in that Jimmy Neutron-looking ass cranium. The premise of Bloodborne is simple, you're a hunter, and there are things that must be hunted. I would tell you more about the overarching story, like why we're even in Yharnam, why there's a bunch of angry furries running around the place, why is this pig so dummy thick, and what's German doing all alone in the woods with a life-sized female doll. But in typical From Software fashion, I have no idea. The game begins by waking up in a hospital bed, with me being pretty sure that I've just been roofied by this old dude. I'm greeted to the absolutely terrifying sight of this concerningly large dog, and decide that my best plan of action is to fist it to death. So after attempting to fist the concerningly large dog, but proceeding to be fisted by the concerningly large dog, I get sent to the hunter's dream. The hub area of the game. The filing shrine of Bloodborne, if you will. But instead of a mute, you've got German's walking fleshlight. This is where you'll be coming to spend this game's version of currency and XP, Blood Echoes. Essentially working in the exact same way as Dark Souls, where you can use them to purchase items, level up your character, or use them alongside materials for upgrading your weapon. The only problem being with it is that it's only accessible via lampposts, and every time I go near one, I have the uncontrollable urge to become a moth. But unlike bonfires, you can't rest at them to refill your HP and have access to a level up menu. You need to use the lamppost first to travel back to the hunter's dream to then have access to all of that. Because much like an abusive stepfather, I love this game, but it doesn't love me. Essentially meaning that if you're running this on the base PS4, then you've become the disabled toddler. I pick up my starting weapon, the saw cleaver, and in typical Big Will fashion, I spend the next few minutes confused out of my mind trying to figure out how to leave the hunter's dream. I would ask the doll lady, but German's been at her again and she's starting to smell a bit weird. 
Now armed, I return to the dog to assert my dominance with some good old-fashioned animal abuse gotcha, bitch. before suddenly being transported back to 2012 as a far less sexy will, swearing that the sound effect for unlocking a new location is the same as the Cinema Sin sound effect. I exit the building and come face to face with one of the game's most vile and horrific creatures. A British person. Who I definitely didn't immediately die to because that would be embarrassing. So in order to avoid that from happening again, no, not the British person, one, I'll need to get good, and two, I'll need to use blood vials to refill my health. Blood vials being Bloodborne's answer to the Dark Souls Estus flask. Bloodborne is a much faster paced game than the FromSoft entries that came before it. Well, not counting the adventures of Cookie and Cream, obviously. And appealing to the methamphetamine connoisseurs, the game encourages you to take it on in a manic, hyperactive, I think I'm currently suffering from a psychotic break fashion, thanks to the sheer amount of blood vials you can carry on your person. Not forgetting the incredibly welcome feature that is being able to recoup a little bit of lost HP by hitting an enemy right after taking damage. No, that's a lot of damage! And a pro tip for you, even if the enemy is dead, you can continue to fondle their cadaver until the death animation is ended to regain a little bit more HP. So what all of this does, apart from creating a lifelong fascination with dead bodies, is like your mentally unwell homeless man hanging out near the gas station causes you to be hyper-aggressive. But unlike your local mentally unwell hyper-aggressive homeless man, you're rewarded for it with blood echoes, whereas he's just subjected to police brutality. Think nightmare creatures, but I'll crack. Plus you can beat people up in wheelchairs, so that's a bonus. In a lot of ways, Bloodborne's combat system is a polar opposite to the Dark Souls combat system. Whereas in that game you'd be punished for being greedy, in this game you're rewarded for it. So long as you're actually good at it, that is. Which I most definitely am. <coughs> While you're busy running around the streets of Yharnam, getting dripped out in the sewers with your poo-scented hunter's outfit, and knocking on random people's doors for the in-game equivalent of the YouTube comment section, Laz, you come on. <coughs> you might notice that you're quite literally packing heat. Don't ask me where I got this flintlock strap from in a country where they'll arrest you for possession of a butter knife. Um, I certainly hope you've got a license for that knife. Well, but I think it was German because it smells like that questionable looking fluid I saw dripping from the doll earlier. All I know is that they're bad at being guns and good at being shields. Which is a weird thing to say when you take into account that it is indeed not a shield, but a gun. Remember parrying? Well now you can do it from a distance. This is what innovation looks like gamers. So you've beaten up some Brits, been shanked by the local youths outside of the corner shop, and are now carrying an incredibly large dangerous weapon. In other words, the average night out in the UK. So now it's time to delve into one of the main draws for people who seem to enjoy these Souls-like games so much. Not counting the concerning amount of increasing sadomasochistic behaviour that is. The bosses. Here's where you'll truly discover that 1. You suck at this game, and 2. Aggressiveness is the key to life. Trust me, run into any situation IRL hyper-aggressively and I promise you there will be no negative repercussions. Let that crackhead energy flow, baby. STOP RIGHT THERE, CRIMINAL SCUM! The first main boss I faced was Father Gascoigne, a closet furry who doesn't unleash his true power until you sufficiently insult the fandom. Much like the dummy thick asylum demon that came before him, Bazinga! Gascoigne serves as a barrier of entry to the rest of the game. But unlike our bootylicious friend, Gascoigne has a pretty large starting area before him that allows you to become closely acquainted in the art of dying, but also allowing you to become closely acquainted with levelling up your character and understanding the base mechanics of the game. Because I proceeded to get fucked by Father Gascoigne as if he's a Catholic priest and I'm a prepubescent boy. He's a good challenge for the start of the game, and where you learn that you can also parry most bosses for a massive visceral hit. Parrying being something that is absolutely worth learning how to do, and if the comments on my Dark Souls video are true, something that is directly tied to how much of a man you are and how many women you have slept with. Just don't ask me, how come when I shoot this enemy normally does my literal bullet from my also literal gun do no more damage than a pensioner's fart passing by in the wind, but when I shoot at this very specific time, now all of a sudden he's tripping over his laces and falling on the floor. Because what do I know about guns? I'm from the UK. The gun ownership laws here are actually quite similar to the amount of serotonin in my head. Non-existent. You might recall earlier when I referred to Father Gascoigne as the first main boss of the game, hinting at the existence of optional bosses in the game. And optional being a word we simply don't subscribe to around here because that would imply the illusion of choice, and my sadomasochistic tendencies say otherwise. There will be suffering, and I won't enjoy it. The Cleric Beast is a boss you can technically fight before Father Gascoigne if you want, 
That is, if you like the idea of being relentlessly screamed at by some giant hairy thing, which I'm sure some of you do. And once you're done looking at Cleric Beast Rule 34, you might realise that it's now giving you the ability to purchase an item that allows you to skip a whole section of the game. A section of the game that I didn't realise was optional until after I got machine gunned to death. Because my god, these Victorian era smallpox infested Brits know how to party. And talking about partying, I then proceeded to spend about 30 minutes attempting to fight said machine gunner until he slipped on a puddle of his own Mountain Dew scented gamer sweat and was sent flying into the Shadow Realm, aka Birmingham. This teaches you three things. Okay. A short drop and a sudden stop is a better alternative than living in Britain. My audio still sounds like this. And that it's worth exploring and facing optional bosses because you never know what you might find. Pain. Mostly pain. By this point in the game, you might have noticed something that all us humans are unfortunately forced to deal with. The passage of time. Not the inevitable panic attack inducing full molecular breakdown of our chemical structure as a whole, yet but that the sky does this really scary thing called going dark, and I forgot to bring my nightlight. The further into the night you get, the further the world leans into the realm of racist cat owner and cosmic horror book writer. Things go from bad to worse as we go from being yiffed by furries to finding out what lubricated eel tastes like as the tentacle hentai community comes out to play and infect my computer with malware after searching up questionable sites for research purposes. And while the night does this nifty little thing known as progress, it also kinda doesn't. At least not until you progress. So it's not like a dead rising time limit that puts you in a constant state of severe anxiety, as both your ADHD and OCD tendencies battle it out inside your cranium for the mere shards of dwindling brain power you have left. You will get up from your gamer chair with heart palpitations and a booty shaped sweat imprint, but not because you were fighting the clock, but because you were fighting for your life. And much like the classic, satisfying level design of its predecessor that had you going up, down and all around with interconnected paths, lending itself to the excellent feature known as door closed by a device, come back later scrub, it also has optional areas to visit as well, if you like the idea of being abducted by meth head Santa and taken to the metaverse. We are live from my backyard where I am smoking a brisket and some ribs. But Zuck hasn't quite polished off all of the code yet, as instead of being harassed by middle-aged women asking to join their multi-level marketing scheme, I was stomped to death by an invisible pig that morphs its way through the geometry as it was on its way to tickle my bacon rasher. KO! The second mandatory boss, after old dude with a serious case of the zoomies, is Vicar Amelia. But this boss fight is incredibly unrealistic, because much like the existence of evolution, extraterrestrial life and homosexuals, the church doesn't believe in women. After crying about something, she has a typical female overreaction and suddenly explodes into a horrific, unsightly, otherworldly being and proceeds to violently eat my insides as I beg for mercy. The boss fight with Vicar Amelia highlights one of my favourite things about Bloodborne, not that I'm currently beating a woman, but the sheer overwhelming scale of some of these Chad monstrosities that you, being a little soy boy, or soy girl, we don't discriminate around here, has to learn how to take down. And the game just kinda goes, have fun. And now that I'm done committing yet another crime to spite Peter, thinking with an IQ higher than the average Redditor, I decided to tackle the DLC, which unfortunately resulted in the DLC tackling me. You see, the DLC takes place in a location known as the Hunter's Nightmare. A location that certainly lives up to its name, as it is indeed a fucking nightmare. So praying to the old gods to channel the countless skills I've accumulated due to my treacherous yet rewarding experience with past Souls games, much like my father did to me, I just kinda left and forgot about it. Fuming from my embarrassing defeat by the hands of dude with weaponized anal beads, I decided to check Google to figure out what I was supposed to be doing next, because this game has a really nasty habit of assuming that my last few brain cells are capable of this little thing known as common sense. And I came to the realization that I'm headed to Romania to relive some of my fondest memories as a youth and sneak into an old dilapidated building to beat some near defenseless old women to death, which I'm only now learning is optional. But let's be honest, whenever is a good old fashioned pensioner beating an option. But it's a good thing that I did come here, not just because I haven't felt a rush like that in years, but that I've now acquired the Rune Workshop tool. A tool that allows you to equip multiple runes that essentially work like 2009's Modern Warfare 2, with the likes of Marathon, Stopping Power and Steady Aim to become the ultimate killer and call in the AC-130. A kill streak that I wish I had brought with me to the next area, as when I began my journey into the Forbidden Woods, I came face to face with hands down one of the most harrowing, terrifying and most disgusting creatures to ever have been put in a video game. 
Snake Ball. Oh, snake. And after somehow accidentally ending up playing Resident Evil 4, I ended up facing off against the Shadow of Yharnam, a trio of enemies not even worth the boss health bars put at the bottom of the screen, whose most interesting thing about them is that halfway through the fight, they all suddenly sprout snake titties out their chests. And not even I'm that weird. Next on the list of things to want alive is Rom, who you might recognise from their 2002 breakout hit, Eight-Legged Freaks. But before I can commit generational genocide against a mother and all of her children, I must first defeat the final boss of the game. This lady, who for some reason likes to carry around a pocket-sized tactical nuke in her back pocket, and is more aggressive than my ex-girlfriend after half a bottle of red wine and much like my ex-girlfriend, could only finally be defeated by consuming a questionable substance, applying an electrical buff to my weapon, and a hefty therapy bill. I then proceeded to stomp on some little children and empty an entire can of Raid, before meeting Fred. Hi Fred. But I think I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere, as somehow I've ended up in Ohio, where everyone is hyper-aggressive, doesn't stay dead, and these ethereal beings are just vibing. This is what peak fun looks like, gamers. Much like the rest of the game, there's a boss at the end of the area, but in order to safely reach said boss, you must first run around killing all of the girl bosses as they harass you to like their small independent business Facebook page while simultaneously raising the dead. In other words, an incel's favourite part of the game. And then I make it to the boss, the one reborn, who I quickly make unborn as I channel the power of summoning another player and beat the boss in speedrunner world record time. And remember kids, summoning is only cheating if you care, and cheating is only bad if you get caught. I decided to take a quick pit stop back to the Hunter's Dream to check up on the nice kind doll lady, and after noticing this strange black mold infested fungi growing across her face, I realised German was nowhere to be seen, presumably cowering away in shame in hopes of not receiving any of my mycelium related questions. I then strangely find myself drawn to a location from my nightmares that I swore I would never revisit. School. But this must be an American school, because I can kill all of the children. After conducting a revenge killing on my childhood bully, getting teleported to Hogwarts and making my way through Harry Potter and the Deathly Framerate Part 1, I'm forced to beat a man to death with a chastity cage on his head because he paid me 20 bucks and told me that's the only way he can get off. After wiping away the questionable substance he got all over me, like bro what's wrong with a Kleenex, I'm finally ready for the part I've been most excited for. Murgo's wet nurse, and I'm quickly left feeling defeated and lied to, as there's not one tig old bitty big mummy milker in sight. After defeating this liar and receiving a nice little tasty snack for later, I return home to find the German's been microwaving metal spoons again and that he's been defrauding the government to receive disability benefits. At first I was a little bit intimidated by this fight, but then I remembered a key piece of information. I already did it about 20 hours ago. German's basically just a souped up version of the Father Gascoigne boss with two key differences. Significantly less time spent yiffing, and that he teaches the From Software fans the valuable lesson of touch grass. With German swiftly defeated, I'm fondled by this hentai tentacle creature from the sky, and I break out into a panic as in typical From Software fashion and typical Big Will fashion, I've realised that I've killed the final boss without taking into account that it would immediately throw me into a new game plus cycle, and I'd be forced to start from the beginning of the game. So realising that I hadn't done the DLC or Chalice dungeons yet, after a sigh and a brief Ah oh, shit, here we go again. It was time for new game plus. And much like when my mother gave birth to me all of those fateful years ago, I realised that I had made a terrible mistake. The game is hard and I want to go home. Bloodborne is like living in a Final Destination movie. Everything wants to fucking kill you and I keep getting these weird visions. Good morning. So in order to actually be able to enjoy the game, you know, the reason people play games, well except for those competitive Counter-Strike players, there's something wrong with them, I make the decision to restart the entire game, run through it as fast as I can, levelling up my character and weapon to plus 10, enacting revenge on the machine gunner by simply shooting him, and discover one of the most useful items in the game, a pebble. A lot of the enemies in this game suffer from the condition known as terminally stupid, and if you throw a rock near them, they'll wander away from the safety of their group to investigate it, to then find themselves investigating the end of my plus 10 saw cleaver as it graciously deletes them from existence. And if you mix that with the beast pellet buff, which is like crack but for cool people, have fun deleting them from existence, but faster. Something that I discovered this time but not on my first playthrough is that there's blood in my stool for some reason and that Patches is in the game. But I saw that, panicked, and knew it had to die. It's not my fault I have arachnophobia and a fear of bald people. I got to the point where I'd upgraded my weapon as high as it would go, and was pretty sure I wouldn't get vigor checked by the first thing I came across. So once I got towards the end of the game again, I was once again ready to enter the Hunter's Nightmare. 
but there was this strange feeling I had about it. It could be that the syphilis has finally begun to rot my brain, but no, I have at least a few more years left in me yet. It was the chalice dungeons, which is basically the same thing, as I was running through these bored out of my mind, swearing that I could feel the brain rot setting in. The chalice dungeons are like Bloodborne, but bad. So anyway, back to my dreams. Huh, this has significantly less anime waifus than I remember. And yes, it's still hard. Not quite as hard as when I see a lingerie mannequin in the store, but still difficult. I still don't know why I'm banned from them all. Your first hurdle is average English person after their favourite football team loses. And your second hurdle is Kev from earlier after he's had a few pints of Guinness and sees a brown person. The first main boss, apart from casual racism, is Ludwig, the average dog in Ohio. You fight Ludwig in your typical Vietnamese sweatshop, evident by the concerning amount of deceased people on the floor. And he's been a bad boy. He's not interested in waiting till after dinner to have his treats, and will casually laser beam you to death if you dare say otherwise. After death, after death, after death, he left me no choice. He forced my hand and forced me to enact drastic measures. Buy him some Colgate. To summon an NPC to help me fight. You see, the thing about summonable NPCs in this game is that they're absolutely dog shit. They haven't quite grasped the concept of a door frame. It's like FromSoft looked at them and went, I like this idea, but let's make them stupid. And stupid is exactly what I need right now, because too stupid makes us smart. So what I do is use the NPC to attract all the aggro from the boss, as I beat Ludwig and his very British teeth to death without him even acknowledging my presence. This game's easy. It's not my fault I'm so good. After being really glad to leave the blood piss swamps and all of its really lovely inhabitants, bloody fuck you, bloody. I face the final boss of the game. Except there's two of them. Nani? And I'm glad to finally be in the home of an average Twitter.com user with their unusually large craniums for their unusually large brains. I see someone in a wheelchair, so instinctively push them off a balcony, and then get ready to fight off against my arch nemeses. Tall minions. After every Facebook mum's favourite meme template is dispatched of, This was a terrible day. First my ex got hit by a bus, and then I lost my job as a bus driver. I have a disease called awesome. You won't understand, because you don't have it. Your father and I are getting a divorce. <laughs> it was then time to face off against Gru, otherwise known as Budget Melania. And oh boy did she stab me more times than I stab a frozen microwave meal packet. And much like living a life sustained on only microwave meals, I didn't live very long. Until I did. Because much like a socially undeveloped virgin using their mother's credit card to get a female streamer's attention, I didn't get the hint. After betraying the ways of the simp, we walk through the Big Will-sized glory hole and find ourselves in Scotland. And much like the real Scotland, I find myself surrounded by people I don't understand who are simultaneously trying to beat me up with large pointy sticks in one hand and a two-litre bottle of iron brew in the other. After coming to the fair compromise of beating my skull in, I'm eventually let through to continue my final stretch of the journey. Complete the mission I was sent from God to do. Bring peace and order to the world once more. Kill an orphan. It's not like anyone's gonna miss you anyway. I hope you enjoy being beaten over the head by a creature wielding a chunk of placenta after it falls out of its deceased mother's dead ussie. Because I sure don't. The real kicker here is that I almost killed this fetal alcohol syndrome looking ass parentless creature on my first try, and then proceeded to die for three hours straight. And that is what I like to refer to as not a good time. This made me want to cry more than the birth of my firstborn child. At least I can put my child to work in the coal mines. What am I supposed to do with this? Bar develop a fetish for being beaten by a meaty chunk of placenta. So I had to do what any and every Souls player is bound to do at some point. I sat down, fought really hard about life, and proceeded to get good at summoning other players. And even then it was a close call at times, as the orphan is more aggressive than late stage lung cancer. The strategy was simple. Use the Ludwig technique of having someone else draw aggro, and then going up behind him to gently pat him on the back. Now repeat that 35 times. Or you could just get good at the game and get the boss stuck in an infinite parry loop. But I have better things to do with my life, sorry. Like cry. That's it. I fulfilled my duty as a true Catholic, and channeled my inner schizophrenia to fucking kill everything I don't understand. Yarman is now free of demons, and women who understand math. We don't tolerate witches around here. And there you have it. I've beaten Dark Souls 4, and have covered all optional bosses, areas, and alternative endings, and I dare you to try and comment otherwise. My closing thoughts and summary on the game is as such. Bloodborne can best be described as if you gave the average Victorian child with a life expectancy of 11 years methamphetamine, and told them that if they kill all of these ancient, otherworldly beings, they'd be allowed a second slice of stale bread. Bloodborne is hands down one of the games I've ever played. It's like Elden Ring, but not. Free likes, and I'll play Sekiro Nintendo Wii Edition next. Hey, check out my clothing brand Morbid Minds. It's Morbin time. <laughs>